Hello, and welcome back to your regularly scheduled episode. I am recording this on a Saturday morning. If you're a subscriber, you already know this, because I just recorded that one before this one. And I also talked very heavily about what is going on in the royal family right now. I don't know if I have it in me to do it again, so if you're very interested in that, you should head over there and listen. To sum it up, if you don't know what's going on, I don't have time to explain that to you. There is absolute madness going on in the royal family right now of levels we, we have not seen <laughs> ever, maybe, or at least since Harry and Meghan were there. Kay Middleton has been seen a long time, even though they told us she wouldn't be seen because she had a planned abdominal surgery. Now it's coming out that like her staff didn't know about the surgery, which is weird, and also that Kate had been like scheduled to be abroad somewhere during this time. So like that just it's not adding enough that it was a planned abdominal surgery. I think that's part of it. I do think maybe she did have a pr- a procedure of some sort. I don't know what kind. I don't think it's really important. And I think maybe she just doesn't want to be seen. The most likely scenario is she doesn't like the way she looks. Maybe they put her on steroids for the surgery or something. Steroids can make you very puffy. Something like that. She may just be unhappy with how she looks. Because it's weird. The amount of time she took off for this planned abdominal surgery would be like months. Which is odd for a family who makes their women give birth to a child. And then 14 minutes later they make them put on a dress and stand in the street. So it's weird that they would have months or that Kate would be allowed or expected to take months off for the surgery. So my most likely non-conspiracy theory is that Kate is just unhappy with how she looks. That's why we're not seeing her. It tracks. My most likely conspiracy theory is I believe that William did cheat on Kate. I believe he wants a divorce. I don't think Kate would ever, ever initiate a divorce this close to her being on the throne. If you are not familiar with the royal family or William and Kate that much, if you watch The Crown or or whatever, that is pretty accurate to what happened. Kate's mom really tracked, not in like a stalker kind of way, but really kept tabs on where William was going to school, when he was going to school, taking gap years, things like that, so she could have... Kate Middleton be where he was at the same time. It is no accident that they met is what I'm trying to say. So I don't think they didn't call her weighty Katie for nothing. All right. That was her nickname for a long time. Cause William proposed after eight years and he broke up with her before he proposed to her. So they named her weighty Katie. I don't think weighty Katie would be willingly leaving this Royal family when she is maybe less than five, ten years away from achieving everything that her and William have worked for. I think perhaps William cheated on her. They get into a fight. He wants a divorce. And they are slowly trying to phase Kate out in a way that the public won't be so outraged. Because why else would they release a, fo- a terribly photoshopped picture, arguably, Not terrible, but just bad enough that, like, that should not have happened. You have, like, all the money in the world. And then what really stuck out for me that something was wrong is they let Kate take the blame for that Photoshop fail. And even if it was her fault, it's weird to allow her to put herself out there like that. They could have said anything. A mystery staffer, mystery editor, sorry, we someone edited the photo, whatever. They let... A note come out with Kate saying, oh, hey, sorry, that was in my entire fault. And if you're thinking it's not that big of a deal because it's just like a Photoshop picture, she probably just photo, not her, I still don't think she did this. <clears throat> Whoever Photoshopped it probably just put new heads on the kids' bodies because it's so hard to get kids to smile at the same time. But the media that they have in their pocket, there's a name for it. I still can't remember. I said it on the subscriber episode too, is now doubting the legitimacy of the things that Kensington Palace is sending them. So they're like this, they're sending us doctored photos. We don't know what to believe. They immediately unpublished the photo because it was not real. And they are letting Kate take the fall for that. 
which I I find very odd. That's the one part of this where I do find something very odd about it because people love Kate. And if he is planning on divorcing Kate, there will be they're trying to soften the blow essentially, I think. I don't know if it has anything to do. I do think he cheated on her. I do believe that with my whole soul. He is Charles's son through and through. I will stand by that. I don't care about I don't think it's I just I fully believe it. And his mistress's name is Rose of Chumley. If you don't know how to pronounce that, it looks like it's like Chalamande or something. It's Chumley. They need to get serious about the way they pronounce their names, if we're being completely honest. Anyway, that's my two cents about what the hell is happening on the royal family. Not that anyone really cares, but you guys know that I do, so it has been at the forefront of my brain for like weeks now. Where's Kate? I'm loving all the conspiracy theories. Someone Googled how long it took for bangs to grow out, and it's like the exact amount of time that Kate's taking up, taking off, so perhaps she got terrible bangs. Maybe she got a BBL. We never know. We don't know. Maybe she's filming The Masked Singer. Someone said perhaps she's doing The Traitors, which I think would be a great choice for her. I don't think Kate is... I don't think Kate is gravely ill, dead, or dying. I don't think that. I think that's that's a bit much. But I do th- I do think something is going on. Either her surgery didn't go that well, she has bad side effects, she doesn't love the way she looks, or William is a cheater and everyone has had enough. I'm not sure I believe that Rose is pregnant, was pregnant, or fathered or had children by William. That's another thing going around that perhaps some of Rose's children are actually Williams and then she was pregnant and Kate lost her mind. I don't know if I believe that. It's almost too soap soap opera-y. And I don't think I have anything else. Alrighty. So today I am doing the murder of Selena Quintanilla, which was a case requested by my mother and one of my best friends, Sammy. So (laughs) thank you for requesting it. It was always one that I wanted to do, but it seemed so daunting at the time. So thank you for giving me... Oh, this bitch. All right. Hello. (laughs) I want you to know that I have stopped and started recording this four times because Harvey has been in here. And she is being terrible. And she just knocked over an entire iced coffee onto the carpet and then would not stop trying to drink it. And I honestly don't have the energy to start over again. So whatever I was just talking about, let's go with that because I don't remember. (laughs) So I'm just going to get started because I can't do this anymore. (laughs) So Selena Quintanilla was born on April 16th, 1971 in Lake Jackson, Texas to Marcella and Abraham Quintanilla. Her mother had Cherokee ancestry and her father was Mexican-American. Fun fact. I'm still out of breath from jumping up to clean up the coffee and get Harvey out of here. So please don't judge me. (laughs) But fun fact, the OBGYN at her birth was future Congressman Ron Paul, which I thought was funny. Anyway, her father had opened a small restaurant in 1980 And in only a year, they had to shut down the restaurant and declare bankruptcy because of a recession caused by the 1980 oil glut, which I couldn't quite figure out what that was. Like, there was too much oil because there wasn't as much as a demand for it. I'm not sure. I can't begin to understand anything not related to Taylor Swift or the royal family right now. Their home also got foreclosed on, so they were forced to move, and they relocated to Corpus Christi. Early on, Selena began to really, like, flourish in her personality and become, like, her own person. One of her first grade teachers said that she was just, like, a delightful child. She had a very bubbly, positive-type personality. She was eager to please and eager to learn, which is, like, a theme in her entire life. She said she was the type of little kid that you would like to have in class, And she remembered that she was, like, also a little shy. She was, like, all of that, but there was, like, a level of shyness to her. So Corpus Christi is where Selena Elos Dinos was formed, which is, like, 
it stayed her band for her whole career, but they eventually just dropped the last part and she went by Selena. But this was like their family band. So Selena's dad, who they often refer to as Quintanilla Jr., because Selena's brother's name is Abraham also, and they call him A.B., just in case I say one of those, that's the difference. Quintanilla Jr. is her father. So Selena's dad had actually played with Los Dinos, and then Selena joined when she was around 10. Her dad said he knew when Selena was about 6 that she had a real gift for singing. He told People Magazine her timing, her pitch were perfect. I could see it from day one. Her father had always wanted to get back into music because I said he was in the Los Dinos, but that was like several years before this. He just felt like he was getting too old to get back in the music scene. But when Selena burst into song one day, he sort of had this like epiphany of like, this is how I can get back in the music scene. Her father converted the garage into a music studio. A friend gave him an old Sears Silvertone bass, and he bought a set of drums. So A.B., her brother, was on the bass, and Suzette, her sister, was on the drums, and Selena was the singer. Her father would say they knew zero about music. I just placed the entrance in their hands and said, all right, let's go. So her father sort of formed the band around Selena. They still, like, played outside and went and did stuff like normal kids, but they always knew what time band practice was, and they never missed it. Her father would eventually, like, put ads on the paper to fill, like, the keyboard and lead guitarist roles and things like that. So at a certain point, they were, they are, like, a full-fledged band. It's not just the bass and drums and Selena. They would perform anywhere they could. Weddings, quinces, fairs, events. They had already had experience because they would sometimes perform at the family restaurant to entertain the guests. However, some places were harder to play than others because of the Tejano music that they played which is like a mix of Mexican and American, like even like polk, folk, things like that. So it's a a big mix of cultures, sort of. They were sometimes booed, sometimes food was thrown at them. They did not have like an easy rise to the top. It wasn't an instant success by any means. Music quickly became Selena's life. Selena kept missing classes because of band gigs, eventually causing Selena to drop out and focus on music. She would obtain her GED when she was 17. A few of her teachers were outwardly critical of this, saying Selena had a lot of potential academically, and the whole music scene she was being immersed in it just was not really appropriate for a girl her age. However, it was very clear that was where Selena was the happiest. It's not like she's being dragged to these gigs at these places that she doesn't want to be at and singing songs she doesn't want to. She loved all of it. Selena wanted to record English songs, but her dad thought she should record music closer to her heritage. That is why she started recording in Spanish. Selena y Los Dinos was signed to Freddie Records around 1981. That did not work out for just several reasons. They felt the band wasn't ready to record, like, release a record yet. They felt that Selena didn't make a good front person for the band because Tejano music was such a male-dominated genre. They just really did not think having Selena be the lead of the band was ever going to work because it really hadn't worked before. The women in Tejano music didn't really rise to the top like the men did. So Selena's dad like found another record label while they were still signed to the first record label. It was just like it was just a, a mess. So it wouldn't be until about, like, 1987 that they released their first album without any legal threats or issues because they had been, like, releasing music that whole time under one label, but they were owned by a different label. It was all a mess. So 1987, they finally have severed all ties and, like, are starting anew, and they release their first album. It would move very fast after that for Selena. She was promoting one of their albums in 1985, when she caught the eye of Rudy Chirino, who was the founder of the Tejano Music Awards. And after the release of their album Alpha in 1987, Selena won Best Female Vocalist at the Tejano Music Awards and would go on to win that award for the next eight or nine years consecutively. They would release a few more albums over the next few years, keep going to the Tejano Music Awards, 
but it would be at the 1989 Music Awards that Selena would be spotted by Jose Bahar of the newly formed label EMI Latin Records. So EMI was a label that already exists, and they had just added this new like Latin division. So he's there with the new head of Sony Music Latin. Jose said the place just exploded with excitement when Selena was on. He was like very certain he had found the next Gloria Estefan. He had approached Selena a few times backstage at that show, telling her, he was like, hey, I'm from EMI Latin Records, and Selena was basically like, yeah, right, buzz off. Like, she did not believe him at all. He eventually sought out Selena's father to talk to him instead. He would later say it wasn't even on his radar to have her sell Spanish records. That's not what he originally signed her for. Like, he didn't sign her to try and dominate the Tejano market. Like I said, he was treating her like a Gloria Estefan, he kept saying. He was searching for new Latin acts and wanted to sign Selena to EMI's label Capitol Records, while Sony Music Latin offered her father twice the amount of Capitol signing fees. So he offered them double the money of whatever EMI Capitol is offering her. Shockingly, her father would choose to sign her to EMI solely because he wanted to be the first people signed to the EMI Latin. So it wasn't about money, it was more of like, We are the first people to do this. Exclusivity, things like that. Another reason they picked EMI was because of the potential of a crossover album. Because Selena really wanted to sing some English songs and sort of like spread out into the United States and other countries in the world, not just Texas and Mexico. She didn't want to be confined to just singing these Spanish songs. She really wanted to like reach a wider audience singing English. They felt EMI offered her the best chance to do that. So Jose requested a crossover album for Selena, and she recorded recorded three English songs and submitted them to EMI Pop, like the main label. The crossover album was denied. They felt Selena did not have the fan base to sell a crossover album, and they just did not think she had crossover potential in general. I love seeing a string of just very wrong men Like, what idiots? What idiots? So, Selena released her debut solo album, Selena, in October of 1987. And like I said, I say solo, but the Los Dinos were still her band. It's still all the same people. They just dropped the name, I guess. Her brother, A.B., became Selena's principal record producer and songwriter for most of her musical career. Selena peaked at number seven on the U.S. Billboard Regional Mexican Album Charts, becoming Selena's first recording to debut on a national music chart. In 1988, Chris Perez would join Selena's band. Their lead guitarist had left to work with another band, and Chris and A.B. had met while they were both touring. So Chris was with another band. A.B.'s obviously with Selena. They had sort of met doing the same tour routes. Chris auditioned at A.B.'s house, and A.B. told his dad to please hire him as the lead guitarist. Because Selena's dad was very skeptical, he did not like the vibe that Chris brought. Chris had his own band as well, and it was like a rock band that sang in English. He didn't really want that image for Selena and her band, but they needed a guitarist, and he was really good, so Selena's dad hired him. This would prove to be more than just a lead guitarist gig. He and Selena quickly fell in love. However, two things were working against this. Chris Perez already had a girlfriend, and Selena's dad was not at all into this. So they decided to just try and stay away from each other. They're just like, listen, let's just maintain a distance. This will never work. Well, obviously, that didn't work. Shortly after that, they sat down at a pizza hut and decided they did not want to be away from each other and decided to finally be a couple. Suzette, Selena's sister, claimed she saw Chris and Selena flirting on the tour bus and told her dad. Not sure why Suzette be snitching like that. Her dad then told Chris that his relationship with Selena was over. However, obviously, they continued on with their relationship. Selena's like 19, 20. You can't tell someone to not see someone anymore, not just because she's like almost, or she is a full-blown adult at this point, but because they're just like gonna make them want to do it more, you know, you like kind of have the have to have the foresight of this is going to backfire. So they continued on with their relationship, hiding it from her family. 
until her father saw them getting cozy or flirting or something going on on the bus with like his own eyes. He pulled the bus over. He and Selena got into a very heated argument and her father called Chris a cancer to the family and threatened to break up the band if it didn't end. So he's like, listen, you can keep this going, but we're done doing this then. We're done touring. We're done with the band, pulling everyone out. Ultimately, Chris Perez was fired and Selena continued on with her career. I believe she tried to leave with Chris. Like, okay, well, if Chris is fired, I'm just going to go with Chris and we're just going to do something else. And her dad was like, yeah, I actually don't think you're going to do that at all. The two would secretly still stay together and they would secretly get married on April 2nd, 1992. Like a literal secret, didn't tell anyone. They got married and it started to leak into the media later that day. And like, that's how people found out. They straight up secretly eloped. Eventually, her family came around and accepted Chris and accepted him back into the band. Her father said he thought that Chris would try and end her career or stop her goals. He ended up apologizing to Chris for that. Thank God. I don't know why he thought that was Chris's goal when Chris is also in the band. They ended up all being neighbors, which I love. So Selena and Chris, her parents and A.B. and his wife all live next door to each other in La Molina, which is a neighborhood in Corpus Christi. And Selena and Chris had plans to move farther out of town and build a house and, like, start a family. So it all worked out. Well, this worked out. So meanwhile, while that's all going on, Selena's career is booming. She releases her second album, Van Comigo, in September of 1990, which had um, Viola Estacumbia on it. It would end up being one of her most successful singles. It was put on a compilation album that was certified platinum. I'm certain you've heard this song, even if you think you have it. It's insanely popular. It's very good, very catchy. It's fantastic. It would be the duet Buenos Amigas that Selena did with Salvadorian singer Alavo Torres that really helped her make the crossover that she had been wanting to do. Buenos Amigos peaked at number one on the U.S. Billboard Top Latin Songs chart, giving Selena her first number one single. The song's music video earned Selena and Torres two nominations at the 1992 Billboard Music Awards. The track also was nominated for Duo of the Year at the 1992 Tejano Music Awards. That song allowed her to tour the West and East Coasts, and it was played more on radio stations that had previously written off Selena's work. So people are starting to realize the mistake they had made in writing Selena off, as mostly because she was just like a Tejano music singer. Now they're starting to realize she can do a bit of everything. In May of 1992, Selena released her third album, Entre a Mi Mundo, which many regarded as her breakthrough album. It peaked at number one on the U.S. Billboard Regional Mexican Albums chart for eight consecutive months and went certified ten times platinum. This is the album with Como La Flor on it, which is the song that I personally think of when I think of Selena. Como La Flor was nominated for Song of the Year at the 1993 Tejano Music Awards and peaked at number six on the Latin Billboard chart. So because of the success, she had some high-profile interviews around the border and in Mexico. Her label was very nervous because, and I don't think a lot of people know this, Selena was not entirely fluent in Spanish. I mean, obviously she knew some Spanish, but she was allegedly very far from fluent. She didn't like grow up speaking Spanish. She grew up speaking English. And a lot of like high power media people would be there and they speak Spanish. They're in Mexico. Also, I think I read Tejanos were sort of looked down on in Mexico for some reason. I'm not sure why. However, Selena ended up winning everyone over. They called her an artist of the people. They called her a breath of fresh air. And they call her a breath of fresh air because they're sort of comparing her to some of the Mexican telenovela stars who had, like, bleached their hair, green eyes, just sort of like... They loved Selena's dark hair, her curves, dark eyes. I think she looked how, like, they wanted a Mexican star to look. Not that you can really... Not that having blonde hair and green eyes makes you any less connected to your heritage, but you know what I'm saying. You know what, you know how people are. Chris wrote in his 2012 memoir to Selena with Love as a third-generation Texan who had to learn Spanish phonetically with her father coaching her on her accent. She knew there was a chance that the Mexican fans might dismiss her. 
And they obviously very much did not. They loved her. But it goes to what I was saying. She didn't really know Spanish. She had to be coached on having a Spanish accent, things like that, which I think is a fun fact. I don't think a lot of people know that. I certainly didn't know that. A Corpus Christi TV reporter said as soon as she hit Mexico, we knew she was gone. He said for a Tejano artist to cross into that market is hard. She took it over like it was nothing. And, like, once you hit Mexico, that will organically find its way into California, which will find its way in other places. So it was really unstoppable once she reached this point. In 1993, Selena released her album Live. It was recorded during a free concert in Corpus Christi and featured previously recorded songs and a few new ones. Live won the Grammy Award for Best Mexican-American Album at the 36th Grammy Awards. In May of 1994, Live was named Album of the Year by the Billboard Latin Music Awards and also at the 1994 Tejano Music Awards. People were calling her the Mexican Madonna because of the bustiers and, like, the tight pants she would wear. She would dress what some might call provocatively. I don't know if I would call it that. But she was not a provocative performer. Her family was pretty religious. So that was very ingrained in her. But, like, you can't stop fashion. She loved fashion. So she obviously wore, like, the greatest outfits known to man. But she didn't act provocative. She didn't, like, dance dirty. She turned down sponsorships with beer companies. She turned down cameos on soap operas because of kiss scenes. She was just very respectful of her and her family's morals. But her dad did say that, like, when she was doing promo shoots in some of these outfits, he would just have to leave. <laughs> like, this is, this is too much. Selena released her fourth studio album, Amor Prohibido, in March 1994. The recording debuted at number three on the U.S. Billboard Top Latin Albums charts and number one on the U.S. Billboard Regional Mexican Album charts. After peaking at number one on the top Latin albums, the album remained in the top five for the rest of the year and into early 1995. This was, to this point, her most successful album so far. It was certified 36 times platinum. It was the second Tejano album to reach year-end sales of half a million copies. It became one of the best-selling Latin albums in the United States and was one of the best-selling U.S. albums of 1995. It was nominated for a Grammy. The two singles, Amor Prohibido and No Me Queda Mas, were the most successful U.S. Latin singles of 1994 and 1995. Billboard magazine ranked Amor Prohibido among the most essential Latin recordings of the past 50 years and included it on its list of the top 100 albums of all time. In 2017, NPR ranked A More Prohibito at number 19 on their list of the 150 greatest albums made by women. So, now, finally, EMI thinks Selena is far enough that she can have a successful crossover album. Now, after being called the Queen of Tejano for how successful she was able to make that career, now they're like, mm, I guess you can sell records in English, even though she was from America and spoke English. She was working on that album at the time she had a sold-out show at the Houston Astrodome in February of 1995. So this is where we're going to pivot and go back in time a little bit. So, Yolanda Saldivar had been a longtime fan of Tejano music by the time Selena came around, and she was just not originally a fan of Selena because Selena sort of burst onto the scene and started winning all of these awards that, like, she wanted her favorite Tejano bands to win. Like, Selena came in and just sort of, like, took over. However, she took her niece to see Selena in concert, and she just realized how good Selena was. She had an amazing stage presence. It just, you can't overstate how good of a performer Selena was. So after the show, Yolanda was looking around to see where she could buy, like, a souvenir there, and there was just, like, nowhere to do it. There was, like, no T-shirts, no keychains, like, nothing of the sort. So Yolanda had an idea to start a fan club. So she called and left Selena's dad 15 messages to try and talk about her idea. She maintains, like, she did not call him 15 times, but that's what Selena's dad said. And I'm inclined to believe him on this one. He did eventually agree to meet with Yolanda, and he gave her permission to go forward with the idea of a fan club. He thought it could be um, good exposure for the band. So in June of 1991, Yolanda became the founder and president of the Selena Fan Club. So Yolanda was in charge of signing up fans for a fee of $22, and they would get things like t-shirts, exclusive interviews, be notified of concerts, normal fan club stuff. By 1994, Yolanda had signed up over 8,000 people. 
which is a lot of people. At first, Suzette was the liaison between Yolanda and the Quintanilla family. Yolanda didn't even meet Selena until December of 1991, so she had been running the fan club for half of a year before she even met Selena. Allegedly, the two became close friends. Some would say Selena mistook Yolanda's obsession for friendship. People would say Yolanda's house was basically a shrine to Selena. And instead of like, not that Selena knew that her house looked like that, but Selena took like her obsession and overzealousness for like genuine friendship. And I think it was an obsession, which isn't like a healthy relationship. In 1994, Selena opened up her boutiques, Selena, etc., ETC, in San Antonio and Corpus Christi. However, since Selena and her family would be touring, they would need someone to run them. Yolanda had been very successful with the fan club, and she had quit her full-time job as a nurse to focus on Selena and the fan club. So, like, to her family and everyone, it just seemed like an obvious choice to have Yolanda run it. The family really trusted her, and she had proven to be a really good assistant to Selena. She would do anything Selena asked. And, like, the fan club was doing great, so they're like, this just makes the most sense. So, in January of 1994... It was decided that she would be the manager of both boutiques, and she moved to Corpus Christi to be closer to Selena. And then in September of 1994, Selena added Yolanda to be able to access the bank accounts in relation to the fan club and the boutiques. This is where it all starts to fall apart. Selena also gave her Amex card to Yolanda so she could, like, seamlessly conduct company business. Obviously, she ended up using that card for other reasons, frivolous spending, things like that. The employees of the boutique stated that Yolanda was great when Selena was at the stores, but when Selena wasn't there, Yolanda was a terror. The employees tried to tell Selena how awful Yolanda was, but Selena just refused to believe her friend Yolanda would betray her business like that. She's like, I don't, I don't think Yolanda would be in here acting like that. By December of 1994, the business accounts did not have enough money to pay the bills. The staff was cut by more than half because Yolanda just fired people she didn't like. Eventually, it got so bad, the staff bypassed Selena and went right to her father. Her father had also tried to warn Selena that Yolanda might not be trustworthy, but Selena was overly trusting, and her dad didn't trust anyone already, so it sort of went right over her head. She's too over-trusting. She'll never have, like, that kernel of doubt popping in her mind, and she knows her dad is crazy, so she's like, you're probably being very dramatic. He also became aware that fans had been signing up for the fan club, paying the fee, and not receiving any of the perks which is like the opposite of (laughs) good publicity. Selena's cousin, Deborah Ramirez, was hired to work at the boutiques in January of 1995 and lasted a week before she quit because of Yolanda and how unorganized she had everything. Yolanda pretty much told her to mind her own business when she questioned the lack of sales reports and receipts for items that were missing but labeled sold. Yolanda also put a bad taste in the mouth of Selena's designer. The two constantly fought. He believed Yolanda was mismanaging Selena's affairs. He claimed Yolanda was would destroy and cut up his designs and often not pay for them at all. Yolanda had to try to turn Selena against him. She illegally recorded conversations between them and played them for Selena. Remember, if you are ever planning to record a conversation, you should see, you need to check your state laws and see if you're a two-party consent state or not. Ohio is not. A two-party consent state, you only need one person to consent when taping a conversation. And if you are in that conversation, you count as the person consenting to it. So in Ohio, you can't, you can't like, set something down in a room and record two people talking when you're not there. But if I am having lunch with someone and I want to catch them in a lie, I can legally record that entire conversation without their permission. Some states, you cannot do that. We know this, obviously, because of the... Taylor Swift, Kanye West, Kim Kardashian phone call. That was illegal because California is a two-party consent state. They needed Taylor's permission to do that. Or maybe they were famous enough that they bypassed the rule. I don't know. But before you do that, make sure what your state law is. And now you can assume that everyone in Ohio is taping a conversation with you in it because they don't need your permission. Selena then wanted to expand the boutique into Mexico and was allegedly working with a man named Ricardo Martinez. He said he had contacts in Monterey, Mexico, and could help her get set up there. Now, her family maintains this man 
was just a fan of Selena who had just taken like several pictures with her. They're like, that's why there's so many pictures of them together. He was just a fan that like Selena posed for a lot of pictures with. He maintains that like he was a business associate to her. And so does Yolanda. Yolanda said like Selena was getting too dependent on him, which was causing Yolanda to get jealous. Yolanda tried to tell Selena that he maybe had other intentions with her than a business relationship. He would send her flowers. Selena would spend a lot of time in Monterey. Like, he may be he may be getting the wrong idea, Yolanda's like, but also she's very jealous of the relationship she had formed with him. And Selena thought the best of everyone, so she was like, no, he definitely not. Because remember, Selena's married at this point. Her father would later say that, like, Selena and her mom were the same in that way. What other people could sense, like, immediately took Selena and her mother, like, weeks to realize. And when they did realize it, they would just think, like, you know, well, maybe they needed the money more than we did. Or maybe they needed this more than we did. You know, you know those people. It's just too nice. What they didn't know was that Yolanda had been accused of embezzling funds from a former job. She had been accused by a San Antonio doctor of stealing more than $9,000 in 1984 when she worked as his bookkeeper. The Aetna Insurance Company paid off the doctor and then settled out of court with Yolanda. So this is, like, documented. So on March 9th, 1995, after figuring out Yolanda had embezzled tens of thousands of dollars from the boutiques, Selena's dad called Yolanda into a meeting. He told her that he knew the boutiques were receiving past due and unpaid bills, and there was no explanation for the missing cash. He said she just stared at him blank-faced as he was explaining that, like, he knew that she was stealing money. And, like, that's where it was going. She never denied anything, but he said at times she became emotional and other times she was, quote, cool as ice. Her father also discovered that Yolanda opened the fan club bank account under her sister's name and could not give a reason for doing so other than the bank wouldn't let her open an account in her own name. He then discovered Yolanda was signing the checks in her sister's name and then cashing them and keeping the cash. He tried to get the bank statements for the account, and of course, they were lost or vanished. Yolanda didn't know where they were. When he went to the bank to ask about the account, apparently it was abruptly closed. The bank had a letter that was signed by Yolanda's sister, but in Yolanda's own handwriting, stating that they needed to close the account because of an emergency. Apparently, this is what the letter Yolanda submitted to the bank said, a fan named Yvonne Perales was sent to the bank to deposit a $3,000 check, but apparently she did not deposit the money, and then they couldn't find her. When he asked Yolanda about it, she said she had never heard of this Yvonne Perales before. Selena's dad was like, you can go lie to someone else because you're not about to lie to me here. And they had brought up, like, you fired so many people because you didn't trust them, but you were sending a fan of Selena to the bank to deposit a $3,000 check. Like, yeah, I really don't think... That what was, that's what was going on. Yolanda abruptly left the meeting, and Selena's father had banned Yolanda from contacting Selena. Selena, however, did not want to bring things off for several reasons. One, I think she did genuinely care for Yolanda despite everything. I think it was just in her nature. And two, Selena thought Yolanda was imperative to the success of her upcoming store in Mexico. I believe Yolanda was doing a lot of the back-and-forth traveling to the new location. And three, Selena knew that Yolanda still had a lot of their paperwork in her possession that they would need back to do, like, the taxes and stuff. This isn't current times. You can't just, like, go onto your e-bank and, like, download all of your statements. Like, these were paper copies that were mailed, and it would be much more convenient for them if they could get those back. So Selena's like, if I cut her off now, the boutique might fail, and we're going to lose all of that paperwork because she's not going to give it to us, which she would be correct in her obs- assumption so between now and march 31st a lot of things happen the day after yolanda was banned from talking to selena selena and yolanda argued over the phone and selena declared not to yolanda but after she got off the phone that she could no longer trust her i don't know what happened on that phone call but she like got off the phone and told chris like i think that's done i don't think i can like trust her anymore She took Yolanda off the bank account and replaced her as fan club president on March 10th, 1995. The next day, Yolanda purchased a gun with hollow point bullets. If you're not familiar with those, hollow point bullets expand on impact, creating much more damage than a regular bullet. So, like, they're a compact bullet, but as soon as they hit something, the bullet sort of, like, expands, and it, like, shreds much more 
I want to say body tissue, but whatever you were would be shooting with these bullets. Animals, fuck, I don't know. I don't know why like some of these things exist. Why do why do hollow point bullets exist? Yolanda would tell the store that she needed the gun because she was threatened by a family member of a patient she was treating as a nurse. Except we know she's no longer doing that, so. On March 13th, Yolanda wrote her resignation through a lawyer and then called Selena and asked to meet in a parking lot 25 miles away from where she was staying in Corpus Christi. When Selena arrived to meet her, Selena told Yolanda she could still handle her her affairs going on in Mexico. This is a decision that her family thinks saved her life that day, as it was like enough to sort of placate Yolanda because her family, her dad, thinks that like Yolanda made her go to that super far away parking lot because she wanted to shoot her, which is probably a safe assumption. So Selena told her father that she wanted to keep Yolanda on as an employee until she found a replacement. Yolanda also so showed Selena the gun she had, and Selena said she would protect Yolanda and she could get rid of the gun. She was like, listen, if, like, if you're that scared of like my family or my dad or anything, like we will protect you. I will protect you. You don't need to have that in your possession. Yolanda returned the gun and then proceeded to steal perfume samples and more bank statements from Selena. Yolanda had went to Tennessee with Selena while she was recording a song for her crossover album. And while there, Selena told Yolanda she would need the missing bank statements. Yolanda then repurchased the gun and asked Selena to meet her at a motel room. Her family believes that Yolanda intended to murder her that day, but people had found out that Selena was in town and, like, tons of fans showed up and there was just, like, no way Yolanda could do anything with that many people around. At the end of March, Yolanda tells multiple people she was raped in Mexico. She called Selena and told her and said that she really needed to see her. So on March 30th, Selena went to her motel room, but her cus- her husband, her husband Chris, <laughs> insisted on going with her. He waited by the truck and then drove Selena home. In the car, Selena discovered that Yolanda gave her the incorrect bank statements. Meanwhile, Yolanda is blowing up Selena's pager, begging her to come back and take her to the hospital that night. Chris Perez did not really care for the whole vibe of, like, what was going on, so he told her that it was, like, it's too late for you to go out alone. I don't want you doing that. Also, on this day, Selena told an employee that she would be firing Yolanda, and the employee was so concerned for Selena's safety that she followed Selena home to make sure she made it there okay. So the next morning, on March 31st, 1995, unknown to, like, her entire family, Selena returns to Yolanda's motel room at 7.30 a.m., There are conflicting reports of this. It was reported that Selena took Yolanda to the hospital for the rape that morning, but when a nurse testified at the trial, she testified that she saw Selena and Yolanda a week before Selena was murdered. I'm not sure. Everywhere I read says that Selena took Yolanda to the hospital that morning, but there is the one testimony that it was like a week before. Either either way, a few... For sure, things happened. Yolanda had told Selena that she was bleeding profusely from the rape, and when they got to the hospital, Yolanda told the nurse that she was, like, maybe bleeding a little, if any at all. Allegedly, her and Selena got into an argument because that was the opposite of what Yolanda had told Selena. The doctor told Selena that Yolanda would have to go to a hospital in San Antonio because the rape didn't happen in this country, and that's where Yolanda lived. They're like, we're a corpus Christi. They were like, we are at Corpus Christi Hospital. This rape happened out of the country. It's not really our jurisdiction. Yolanda lives in San Antonio. She needs to go to a hospital where she lives, just like sort of sort this out. That morning, Selena attempted to call Martinez, but he was in surgery and couldn't be reached. That's the man who was helping her with her um, Mexican boutique. And Selena's husband reached out to her to remind her she was supposed to be at the recording studio, to which she said she forgot she was taking care of one last piece of business and then she would be there. She still hadn't shown up a little while after that, but her dad said Selena was perpetually late, so none of them were super worried. She was supposed to record a new song that A.B. had written with Suzette, so she had, like, this appointment, and people were like, well, she's always late, so there's, like, no cause for concern at the present moment. On their way back to Yolanda's motel, Selena broke the news to Yolanda that she felt they should put some distance between each other and try and make her dad happy. When they got back to the motel room, Selena and Yolanda started arguing. Guests recall hearing a loud argument about business and financial stuff. 
Apparently, Selena had told Yolanda that she couldn't be trusted and dumped out Yolanda's bag to get the bank statements. And in doing so, saw the gun. The gun, like, also toppled out of Yolanda's purse. So around 11.48 a.m., Selena attempts to run out of the motel room as Yolanda grabbed the gun and pointed it at her. As Selena attempted to flee, Yolanda shot her once in the right lower shoulder, severing the subclavian artery and causing a severe loss of blood. The maintenance man recalled hearing this and at the time thought a car backfired. It was so loud. Somehow, Selena was still conscious and attempted to run to the lobby. She left a 392-foot trail of blood from the motel room to the lobby. Just for reference, a football field is 360 feet. She ran over the length of a football field with a severed artery. People recalled seeing her clutching her chest and screaming, help me, while Yolanda was still following her and calling her a bitch. Selena collapsed in the lobby at 11.49 a.m. Her clothes were blood-soaked at this time, and she begged the workers to lock the front door because she was terrified Yolanda was behind her. They called 911 and attempted to work on Selena while they waited for the emergency services to show up. Selena's last words were, Yolanda, room 158, or some variation of that. Her last words were her trying to explain who shot her. The ambulance arrived less than two minutes later. They attempted to place an IV in Selena, but her veins had already collapsed because she had lost so much blood. The paramedic attempted CPR but could not feel a pulse. He said the pool of blood went from Selena's neck to her knees and spread out on both sides. They tried to feel for a pulse for 30 seconds and never got one. They placed a cardiac monitor on her, and the normal level you would want to see is 80. Selena was at 20. He said he knew it was just already too late when they got to the hotel lobby. Quintanilla Jr. and A.B. went to lunch. They returned to the office just as the phone rang. A.B.'s sister-in-law screamed that Selena had been in an accident. Her father raced to the hospital emergency room at the Memorial Medical Center. So, Selena arrived to the Corpus Christi Memorial Hospital at 12 p.m. She, for all intents and purposes, was clinically brain dead at this point. Her eyes were fixed and dilated, and she had no vitals. The doctors were able to get an erratic heartbeat long enough to transfer her to a trauma room and attempt any life-saving measures that they could. Selena's right lung was damaged, her collarbone was shattered, and her veins were emptied of blood. They attempted a blood transfusion to try and get her blood pumping again after cutting her open and realizing she was bleeding internally profusely. So they had transferred six units of blood into her, and they immediately spilled out of her circulatory system. Dr. Lewis Elkins was the surgeon who arrived when Selena was being seen. When he arrived, the ER doctor had already started massaging Selena's heart after it stopped beating to attempt to revive it. So Elkins said he felt obligated to continue the life-saving measures, even though he said if he had gotten there first, he wouldn't have attempted any of this. It was so bad. One of her arteries was severed in two from the hollow point bullet. She was giving a breathing tube at one point. Her collarbone artery was clamped in an attempt to stop the gushing blood. But after 50 minutes, it was clear all the damage was irreparable, and Selena Quintanilla Perez was pronounced dead at 1.05 p.m. on March 31, 1995, at the age of 23, from blood loss and cardiac arrest. Elkins says that was just semantics, though. He said she was definitely already dead when she arrived at the emergency room. Meanwhile, 34-year-old Yolanda Saldivar had gotten in her truck and attempted to flee. A motel employee saw her leave her room with something wrapped in a towel. It was assumed that she was attempting to go to the studio to shoot Selena's father and the people there waiting for Selena to arrive. A police officer spotted her trying to leave and blocked her car in. This would turn into a nine and a half hour standoff in which Yolanda repeatedly held her gun to her head, threatening to shoot herself. The FBI negotiations unit and a SWAT team were called. She confessed that in the motel room she was actually attempting to shoot herself, but Selena went to leave and Yolanda pointed the gun at her and it went off on accident. The police drained the gas from Yolanda's truck and eventually Yolanda agreed to give herself up, but got scared when she saw a police officer with a rifle in the parking lot and continued to stay in her car for three more hours. By the time she surrendered, there were hundreds of Selena fans watching and crying. Because of how huge this was, an autopsy was performed just three hours after the shooting and a press conference was held. The autopsy revealed that Selena was shot in the shoulder and the bullet exited through her chest. Within minutes of the shot, Selena would have lost virtually all the blood in her body. 
However, had the shot landed just an inch higher or lower, the wound would have been far less severe. Her official cause of death was described as exsanguating internal and external hemorrhage due to the perforating gunshot wound, resulting in massive bleeding. The internal examination revealed that she had not ingested any type of drug, nor was she pregnant, which was a rumor that had begun spreading after her death. At the press conference, they did not name Yolanda yet, but the motive her father gave for the murder would have appeared to be because Selena was prepared to fire her shooter. He told the Dallas Morning News that Saldivar was a disgruntled employee. We suspected her of embezzling money, and we started closing in on her, and she just went bananas. She lured Selena to the parking lot of a motel, supposedly to hand, hand over some bank statements and papers, and then she shot her. On April 1st, a vigil was held with a public viewing of Selena's casket. After much harassment and rumors that the casket was empty, her family made what I'm sure is an incredibly hard decision to open her casket and make it a public viewing with the caveat of no video or flash photography. Around 30 to 40,000 fans lined up for a mile to give their condolences and see Selena's casket. On April 3rd, around 600 people gathered, mostly family, for Selena's burial, which was broadcast on several radio stations without their permission. During an Easter Mass memorial, children set free 24 white doves as it would have been her 24th birthday that day. Every evening, the cemetery had to cart away truckloads of cards and flowers. So that same day Selena was buried, Yolanda Saldivar was arraigned and pled not guilty to Selena's murder. She was originally held on a $100,000 bail and was later increased to $500,000 because she was deemed to be a flight risk, which is fair. On April 4th, her public defender quit, fearing the backlash he would get from defending Yolanda. Yolanda is and remains public enemy number one to a lot of people. I can't think of someone who was hated more than this at this time. Not, like, in the whole history, but, like, in this concentrated area, the hate for Yolanda was, the hate per square inch was wild, basically. There were gangs trying to raise her bail money so they could bail her out and then kill her. This was dead ass serious. I mean, defending her would be no easy task to take on. On April 6th, the grand jury decided that there was enough evidence to go forward with a trial. So... Douglas Tinker took on Yolanda's case, even though his wife begged him not to. He was pretty high profile. He was worth about $50 million, and he had been doing this for 30 years. So she didn't get some rinky-dink public defender. She ended up with a hotshot lawyer. The trial was pushed back from August to October. For some reason, I'm not sure. Tinker filed three motions at the new pretrial hearing, a motion to move the trial to Houston, he felt there was no way they would ever get a fair trial where they were with the coverage and the community being predominantly Hispanic. At this time, Houston was predominantly white, so he's thinking we are never, ever going to win with like a predominantly Hispanic jury, ever. So we need to move it somewhere that's whiter. He also submitted a motion to suppress or exclude Yolanda's written statement and a motion to suppress or exclude Yolanda's oral statements made at the time of her arrest. He even called 12 witnesses to make his point about moving the trial. He had former judges, prosecutors, lawyers, things like that. He, he was doing the damn thing. They all agreed that the odds of a fair trial were extremely low, so the judge did agree to move the trial to Houston. The jury was selected on October 9th and included seven white Americans, four Hispanics, and one African American. The trial began on Monday, October 11th, 1995. The jury selection took two days, and the judge opted to not select any alternates, and he decided to not sequester them, which I thought was odd, because this was everywhere. And this is coming off of the tail end of the O.J. Simpson trial, which was obviously a disaster when he walked free, so everyone was very aware of that and how that played out, and they didn't want to make the same mistakes that happened in that entire trial. But I do still find it odd that this jury wasn't sequestered. I think that is bizarre. If I was Douglas Tinker, I would have made a big deal about that, I think. All that's over the news is, like, what a terrible person Yolanda was. And these people, that, if you don't know what being sequestered means, 
that's when they like put you up in a hotel if you're on the jury and you stay there until it's over. Like you don't go home, you don't watch TV, you don't talk on the phone because as a jury you have to be impartial and you can't have like these preconceived notions of anything. So the less you know, the better for a fair outcome. Find it very odd that they didn't do that. And no alternates, which is weird, especially if you're not sequestering. If you're not sequestering, you should have, like, 50 alternates because of, like, what a disaster that could have been. Whatever. Anyway, District Attorney Carlos Valdez opened the trial by saying it was a simple case of murder. Yolanda deliberately killed Selena, and she did it in a cowardly way because Selena was shot in the back. Tinker opened the defense by trying to shift the blame to Selena's dad for some reason. He started talking about how controlling Quintanilla Jr. was and how miserable he made Selena and how he basically drove Yolanda to do something this irrational. The prosecutor called Selena's father and Chris Perez to the stand first. He asked Selena's father if he had ever raped or had sexual relations with Yolanda, and he said no. More specifically, he said something along the lines of, have you seen her? Basically being like, she's so ugly, I would never. Which is just wild to stay, say on the stand. It's wild to say at all. That's like not how rape works because you don't rape someone because they're beautiful. You do it because you're like you're a terrible person. But I digress. He's like, no, because that was like a, a thing she had made up. I think I bring it up later. She had tried to allege that Selena's dad had like sexually assaulted her. They had asked about Yolanda being a thief, to which he said she is a thief. Like, that's not a question. She definitely is one. Tinker opted to not cross-examine him, actually. Tinker said it was because they had, like, her family had just been through enough. He didn't want to subject them to that again. However, he knew it was risky to cross-examine Selena's dad because there was a pretty good chance it could work against them. And Selena's father could garner more sympathy than doubt, honestly. Chris Perez testified that Selena had lost all trust in Yolanda long before the murder happened. Two workers from the place Yolanda purchased the gun from testified and said they had taught her how to use the gun. Then Yolanda had returned it, and then she had repurchased it. So just like we thought. The maintenance man and a maid from the motel testified to what they saw. They had seen Yolanda following Selena with the gun after Selena had been shot, and the maid testified that she had heard Yolanda call her a bitch, and they said she showed zero emotion when walking back to her motel room. The hotel lobby workers also testified. They all basically had the same story. Selena had been shot and collapsed in the lobby and said some variation of Yolanda shot her, the girl in 158 shot her, Yolanda in 158 shot me, and that she yelled for the door to be locked because she was scared she was going to get shot again. The paramedic who worked on Selena on the way to the hospital testified how he tried to save Selena's life while she was clutching a ring. The ring ended up being a ring that was given to Selena by Yolanda and other workers of her boutique. It was like a ring that looked like a Fabergé egg because Selena loved Fabergé eggs. So she was clutching that ring from Yolanda all the way until she was like loaded into the ambulance to go to the hospital. She never let go of it. As he detailed this incident, Selena's family was sobbing. Her mom had to have medical attention from rising blood pressure and Yolanda showed no emotion. The emergency room personnel who saw Selena and Yolanda in regards to Yolanda's rape also testified. They testified that Yolanda gave two entirely different stories, one to them and one to Selena. The prosecutors also showed the outfit Yolanda said she was wearing during the rape, and they said the holes made in her clothes were clearly made by scissors and not from being torn or ripped like she was alleging. The next week, the trial picked back up on October 16th. The jury got to hear the negotiations between Yolanda and the FBI during her nine-hour standoff. Yolanda repeatedly expects expressed her wish to die, but also expressed her fear of being shot if she left the pickup truck. So that came off like very contradictory. Like you want to die, but you're too scared to get out of the truck because you think you're going to die. She also found out during the standoff that Selena had died and yelled at the negotiator from keeping that from her because she had wanted to visit Selena. So she had no idea that Selena died. She thought this whole time that Selena was like going to make it. And something with, like, the negotiation phone picked up a radio signal that she wasn't supposed to be able to listen to. And she had heard that Selena had passed away at that time. Because, remember, Selena was pronounced dead, like, an hour, hour and a half after she was shot. So Yolanda was already in her truck at that time. So she, like, had no access to the world, basically. 
She then told the negotiator about her fear of Selena's dad and how she had bought the gun because she was scared of him and how he threatened to kill her and he had sexually assaulted her by sticking a knife in her vagina and threatening to kill her if she told anyone. So she's saying, I bought the gun because I was so terrified of him and he said he was going to kill me. She said over and over that I didn't mean to do it, suggesting that the shooting was an accident. She also blamed Selena's father, saying he made me do it. He was out to get me. This man was so evil to me. My father even warned me about him. My father said I should get out before I get trapped. She can be heard repeatedly saying some variation of, look what I did to my best friend. I'll never forgive myself. I don't deserve to live. She then explained that she intended to shoot herself in that motel room and was holding the gun to her head when Selena begged her not to kill herself and then opened the door and the gun accidentally went off. In regards to that, they had asked the police officers how many times her gun misfired and went off by accident in the nine hours she was holding it to her own head, to which the officers testified, none. The defense tried to say the officer who was leading the murder investigation had a conflict of interest because he had a Selena poster at his house and Selena's dad had given him a Selena t-shirt. The defense asked why his interrogation of Yolanda wasn't taped, why his notes were destroyed, and why Yolanda wasn't given access to a lawyer. The defense then said Yolanda's confession was signed after 11 intense hours with no access to food, water, or the bathroom. The confession she signed also did not have anything in there stating that the shooting was an accident, like she had claimed. Texas Ranger Robert Garza would reluctantly testify that he had witnessed Yolanda protesting to the officer that the written confession he had prepared said nothing about the shooting being an accident. So Yolanda is basically saying, like, I told you over and over again this was an accident and you're bringing me this written confession and you're not putting that part in there that I'm telling you. Because in her signed confession, it makes it look like it wasn't an accident because it's not in there. It just makes it look like she shot Selena on purpose. And she's saying that's not what happened and they left that out on purpose. A few days later, the Mexican mafia sent Douglas Tinker a signed postcard declaring their intention to harm him and his family for defending Yolanda. Like I said, public enemy number one. The surgeons who operated on Selena testified also. The defense brought up how her father had requested the hospital not perform a blood transfusion because of their religion. They were Jehovah's Witnesses, so that's normal. They don't do blood transfusions. But it wasn't ever his decision to make because Selena was married. So the next of kin to make these decisions would have been Chris. So I don't know why they brought that up because they did end up doing the blood transfusions anyway. But they're like, you weren't doing anything in your power to save Selena anyway. They showed Selena's autopsy photos to the courtroom. Many people, including a juror, became extremely emotional. Except, again, not Yolanda. She seemed very stone-faced. I think she might have just looked down at the table instead. Lloyd White talked about his findings and how Selena was not shot by accident. The prosecution called on a firearms expert who found the gun to be in working condition and stating that the person pulling the trigger must use a great amount of pressure. Like, this is very hard to accidentally shoot off. The prosecution also showed the layout of the motel and how it was impossible that Yolanda would not have known Selena was mortally wounded, which would mean she actively chose to not help her. So the defense then called more motel workers who basically testified that Selena never asked to lock the doors and that there's no way the maid and the maintenance man could have seen what they saw based on the layout of the motel. They're like, where they were, they wouldn't have been able to see or even hear the argument. So there's basically, they're just calling everyone a liar. On October 23rd, they gave their closing statements. The defense asked the jury to not side with an enraged father and Selena considered Yolanda one of her dear friends and had went out of her way to drive Yolanda to the hospital that day, even though she had a recording session scheduled. Basically, like, does that sound like two people who are not friends? The prosecution was like, well, fuck that. They pointed out that Yolanda was a nurse, yet made no effort to administer any aid to Selena after she shot her. If it was an accident, you think you would scramble to save her? Like, oh my god, what did I just do? That was a complete accident. None of that. They told the jury all of the different stories Yolanda had told about the gun and the alleged rape, just everything I had already said. She had, like, made up a ton of stories about why she had the gun, how she got it, blah, blah, blah. We know she was telling different stories about the rape in Mexico. So they're just bringing all of that up. While they waited for the jury to deliberate, lawyers and reporters were all signing autographs for each other. They were posing for sketches. They are taking pictures. Tinker said if the jury never came back, that would be fine by him. However... 
After the closing arguments, the jury deliberated for two hours and 23 minutes and found Yolanda guilty of murder. Her lawyer asked for a sentence of probation. Mm -hmm. Probation, because she had already been punished enough. The prosecutor was not having any of that and reminded the jury that Yolanda shot Selena in the back while calling her a bitch. Like, does that sound like someone who should get zero, zero jail time? Yolanda was scheduled for the maximum sentence of life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Her case was not eligible for the death penalty. Yolanda is currently serving her sentence at the Mountain View Unit in Gatesville, operated by the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. She will be eligible for parole on March 30th, 2025, next year. She spends most of her time in isolation for her own safety. Yolanda had filed appeals and motions for a new trial. Selena's dad said he doesn't really care. Nothing will bring back Selena, and it's probably safer for Yolanda to be in prison anyway. He's like, listen, you can try and get out if you want, but, like, you might just want to stay there. But I don't care what you do. In her first interview from prison in November of 1995, Yolanda said Selena came to me in a dream and told me and told her to tell her story. Yolanda said, I know my God and Selena are with me. It was an accident. She said, there is no happiness, there is no laughter, there is no harmony. Like, now that Selena is dead. She said, I cannot accept she is no longer here. I will never accept that. She even kept calling Selena her daughter, even though they were less than 20 years apart. Yolanda said that's just the kind of relationship they had, which I find not correct. She would say, I never stole a penny from my daughter, She said, when I am ready to reveal the entire truth, I will come with proof in my hand and say, this is what was going on. My God, Selena, and my family know. Just a few updates. Dreaming of You, Selena's long-awaited crossover album was released in July of 1995. If you don't think you know this song, you probably do. It's extremely popular. It sold 175,000 copies on the day of its release in the United States, a then-record for a female vocalist and sold 331,000 copies its first week. Selena became the third female artist to sell over 300,000 units in one week after Janet Jackson and Mariah Carey. It debuted at number one on the U.S. Billboard 200 chart, becoming the first album by a Hispanic artist to do so. And as of this week that I'm recording this, March 15th, Selena's Amor Prohibido is now the second highest certified Latin album in U.S. RAA history. It's uh, certified 41 times platinum, It ranks only behind her own Dreaming of You. So she owns the top two spots. The gun used to shoot Selena was destroyed by the order of a judge and parts of it were thrown in the Corpus Christi Bay. This angered many historians and fans as they thought the gun should be kept in a museum, which I understand it does sound morbid, but I see where they're coming from. The motel room where Selena was shot essentially turned into a shrine. People were leaving flowers, writing on the door hanging up notes, pictures. The motel eventually changed all of the numbers on the room around so people wouldn't know what room it took place in. People also started leaving flowers at the Quintanilla home and then Chris and Selena's home. The week after Selena was killed, People Magazine put her on the cover in Texas and other southwestern states. When the issue instantly sold out at newsstands, the magazine decided to do a commemorative issue in Selena's honor, only the third such tribute in the publication's history at that time. They were originally not going to do this. They didn't think it was that big of a deal. I don't think they thought that many people would care. They were sort of, it was like an oh shit moment for them. Like, okay, we have to like do an actual one and not just the southwestern states. So, obviously, Yolanda will be eligible for parole one year from now. So, Yolanda has been out in the media talking her shit lately Oxygen did a special on the case this year, which Yolanda was directly involved in, which I think is an extremely bold choice. She's still very hated. Yolanda claims that she actually wanted to quit working for Selena, and she wasn't getting fired, and Selena was actually there to essentially guilt her into keeping working for her. And Yolanda's emotions were just running so high that she just accidentally shot Selena. Yolanda also claims that Selena was having an affair with Martinez, the man who said he could help her open her boutique in Mexico, and that Yolanda had been keeping that secret and all the missing funds were not from embezzling, but were from Yolanda buying plane tickets so Selena could sneak and see Martinez, and the money she was embezzling was basically her paying herself back out of the boutique fund. Martinez has also made previous claims that they were having an affair. 
Her family didn't buy it and said the entire oxygen special is full of lies. And even the producer said they couldn't substantiate like these claims at all. They're like, listen, she's saying it, sure, but we cannot in any way back this up. She opens the docu-series with, after so many years, I think it's time to set the story straight. I knew her secrets, and I think that people deserve to know the truth. They made me out to be a monster, and I just want to say I did not kill Selena. It was an accident, and my conscience is clear. I would advise you to not watch the Oxygen special, just because I think it's just going to be very annoying and make people angry. I don't think it's, I don't think there's any revo- revolutionary information in there that's actually true. I think anything in there that seems like a bombshell is probably a lie. I will not believe one bad word about Selena. I just like cannot. She just seems like such a good person. Obviously, I'm assuming everyone knows everything about this because. It was just such a big deal. But in 1997, Jennifer Lopez starred in the film Selena, where she portrayed Selena basically going through her entire life that I just told you about. It was very good. It came out in 1997. It got $35.7 million at the box office, which is crazy. It's just really, really good. If you haven't watched it, please do. And that is the murder of Selena Quintanilla. I can't believe Yolanda could possibly get out of prison next year. I don't know if she will. I, I'm i kind of scared if she does. <laughs> she remains public enemy number one. I think she has only gotten more hated. I think Selena was one of those celebrities who they were. she was obviously a big deal. She was huge. She was breaking records. She was like on the path to stardom. I think she's one of the celebrities who got more famous after she died. It just so happened that Dreaming of You was like her first English album that had gotten released. So that introduced her to a lot more fans in like the rest of the world in the United States and not just Texas and Mexico in that area. So a lot more people found out about this after Selena had died. And I think Netflix just did a different Selena like I want to say show was like a dramatization about Selena's life that introduced her to a lot more people. Also just it's interesting. It's introducing more people to Selena. It is also introducing more people to Yolanda Saldivar, who I believe shot and killed Selena on purpose, broad daylight, cold blood that I think there's no getting around that for her. I don't think other people will see it any differently either. As far as we're all concerned, she is a hot piece of trash. Not hot as in, like, sexy either. Just, like, flaming garbage. So, follow that. I'm sure she's going to be in the media this entire year. Making her case for her to be able to get out of prison. She has always maintained it was an accident. She has never wavered on that, I don't think. I think... That's one of those lies where she said it so much, I think she believes it now. One of those situations, because there's just no way. you got to fess up to, like, something eventually. And I will let you go, because this was an extremely long episode, like I thought. Like I said, I could have put this in two parts. I just, like, really didn't feel like it. I feel like I've been doing that too much, so I'll give you a nice long one. So don't be surprised if next week is kind of short, because now I have to throw something together after spending so much time on this. So don't be surprised, but I told you this was going to be good. I think it was. Thank you for the request for it, and I will see you next week. If you're a subscriber, I will see you on Monday. And that's that. If you're not a subscriber, you should be. You can be. That'd be great. And if not, I'll see you Wednesday. Okay, have a great rest of your week and weekend. Goodbye.